predicted by Dante, we accumulated too much delay during the day of today. So you predicted the past, not the future. You predicted yesterday, actually. But miei poveri occhiali. Okay, so we are uh, we arrived at the last section of uh, our meeting, and I open this section with a short communication, very short. I take actually this to check time. Yes, uh, on paracletic networks and their application, it is uh, a sort of message I want to to give to all of you about the new class of network that can be useful in many circumstances. Actually, you know very well that uh, network theory is one uh, possibly of the hottest topic of today. Network representation has been used in many, many circumstances. I'm not, uh, you know, considering network like the Bible. I consider network as a useful tool for representing a given system. And actually, it's uh, very useful in all cases in which uh, extraction of information from network representation gives you information which is otherwise unavailable. Otherwise, it's not useful. It's another tool to approach uh, uh, complex systems. Uh, so in my view, you have three classes of networks. One are physical networks. Uh, names are just uh, proposal. One is functional networks. And the third one, which is uh, the one I want to describe to you briefly, is paracletic networks. And I promise you that I will explain what this paracletic means. So what is uh, physical network? Physical network is classic complex networks. That is, those cases in which the system itself suggests to you the best representation. So suppose you want to represent, for instance, society, then nodes are immediately individuals forming the society and links are immediately some kind of relationship between these individuals. Uh, www nodes are web pages and links are the eyeball link from one web page to another. So there is a direct mapping. I mean, the system itself tells you how to map uh, the system into, into the network. So we call it physical even though in this case there is nothing physical in www. But just to understand it, yeah, I have some physical reason to make the system into network. There are many examples, I want to skip everything. Maybe this is something that interests the, to the journal, is the science citation index that can be mapped in a big network, and we can extract a lot of information, how valuable is uh, you know, the impact factor of the journal, how, uh, and all these kind of things. As opposed to physical networks, people consider it several times functional network. Today also we had several talks presenting and based on functional network. Functional network is a different issue. Now what you have is basically a multivariate data set. So you have several channels, like EG, like MEG, like whatever, and they are producing for you what here is, uh, uh, you see, a multivariate time series. So you can use all the tools of data series with no need of going to networks. But one way is, OK, I want now to transform this data set into a weighted click, an old world connected network, by just making pass <coughs> number one, which is I choose a metric, a function. Huh? And usually, that's very subjective choice. It's not a, an objective way of determining which is the best function to be chosen for this representation. It's just that you choose a metric, and then you, you, you transform this data into a network, a weighted click, I repeat, in which uh, all pairs of nodes are connected, and the value that you assign to the link between node i and j is nothing but the value of your matrix measured on the pairs of signals i and j. Okay? Then you usually apply a threshold, you transform the for this weighted click into a structured network, and you apply usual measurements from graph theory, and you expect from this way to extract some information on the original functioning. This is most of what is 
show about the brain areas that uh, are correlated here and there. So it's exactly this philosophy. There's nothing here of physical. I mean, everything is subjective. The choose of your function is subjective. The choice of the threshold is subjective. So you have the, the important point is behind this. I want to just remark that uh, it, there is a, a need of a serious mathematical fundamentals of how to choose the best threshold, how to choose the best metric to represent a system, and not to publish papers in which maybe what you say is a spurious result that critically depends on the fact that you choose a given metric instead of another, or a <coughs> given threshold instead of another. OK. Go, 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 go. But. And now we go to the paraclete. But there is a huge number of data sets that you cannot map in either one of the previous uh, situations, in either one of the previous representations. I'm speaking, the typical example I make is blood tests. So you go, you, you make a blood test, and the results of your blood test is not a time series. Is expressions of some variable or fissures that are characterizing your health conditions. Cholesterol that much, uh, <coughs> glycemia that much, and so on and so forth. Evident, evidently, it's not a physical network because cholesterol and glycemia, there is no way of linking them. And it's not also, you cannot also construct a functional network because you would need uh, a time series of your glycemia, a time series of your cholesterol, and this is a little bit annoying to, to, to extract blood each five minutes for two days to have uh, a blood uh, and these things. But you can think also to genetic expressions or you know, metabolic, some kind of metabolic data or fMRI in which you have images with very, very, very bad time resolution. Very good special resolution, but usually very bad time resolution. So you pref you'd better consider them as images instead of considering them as time evolution of something. So basically, <coughs> you have static expression of variables and fissures. It's a huge, the number of data sets that uh, falls into this category. And so far, nobody tre tre treated them as networks. So the issue, the question I want to address is, does it make sense to construct a natural representation for such kind of stuff? And which kind of information can this representation retrieve? Is it useful for something? And now we, we were helped by these fellows. Well, I, I, I don't have time to discuss philosophy, but uh, the concept of parenthesis is a very, very important concept in philosophy. And, uh, this guy uh, wrote in the Rerum Natura, uh, you know, well, I cannot. Anyway, take for good that parenthesis in Greek means deviation. Okay, deviation from a normal behavior, so to say. Eh? It's the concept of devia sudden deviation for, from a normal behavior. And now let's consider our data. Our data, we can think to the problem in this way. We have. Uh, a given set of subjects or systems. And for each one of the subjects, we have, uh, sorry, each one of the subjects is belongs to a given to a class. Okay, I can label the subject. I have a population of uh, one million people that uh, underwent blood tests, half a million are diabetic, half a million are not diabetic. So I have two classes and one million population. And each subject is, by the way, uh, nothing but uh, a, a given number of fissures. Uh, cholesterol, glycemia. So I have a vector that uh, uh, defines my subject with p fissures, and therefore I have a point in a p-dimensional space. And now the fundamental answers that we are making, which is an answer, is that each one of the classes, the diabetic, the non-diabetic, the corresponds to a set of constraints in this p-dimensional space. Therefore, I first 
learn the constraints from the population, then when I have a subject, I will then uh, construct a network eh, in which I assign to this network links to the deviation of this subject from these constraints, the four parenclitic, because it measures the deviation from the so-called normal behavior, which is the behavior that I, by means of this constraint, I'm mapping the population. I don't go to the multi-layer, because this is a multi-layer representation in fact, but so let me skip all the details and go to here. So basically I have several features, several subjects. Imagine just for visual representation to consider R3, three features. So I go to each one of the planes, uh, Fisher 3, Fisher 1, Fisher 2, Fisher 1, Fisher 2, Fisher 3. For each one of these planes, I have my populations. I take a, a, a best representation of the function f of these two Fisher equal to zero that defines the constraints. I can do in a thousand ways with polynomial feeds, data mining methods, support vector machine, artificial neural, I have many, many options. And then, when I have a new subject, which here is a new point in each one of these space, I associate to this subject a network, a parenclitic network, in which the features are the nodes, so what, node number one is cholesterol, node number two is glycemia, node number three is that. And this link has a weight, which is the distance between this point and this line. Now, okay? How the distance means the minimal distance, minimal geometric distance from this point and any other point of this line. <coughs> In this way, I'm constructing a representation. Just to now is wood. Now it's meaningful if we can extract something, of course. Eh? So now let's see what we can extract from this representation. Hmm? And this is a method in which you take any data set you want made of static systems and you map each one of the subjects into a network. Now let's uh, make some examples. First of all, we took uh, some uh, metabolic data of uh, uh, this kind of disease, which is obstructive nephropathy. I don't have time, I cannot explain. It's a child disease, it's very important because it was one of the major causes for kidney transplant, uh, kidney transplant in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in kids. Okay, so it's a serious stuff. You have some control patients in your population, some uh, uh, disease patients in your population, and you take as a reference the control, okay? So you construct, you have all your uh, constraints from the data of the control, and then you try to predict what the new uh, guys are. And you see that if you take a, 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 a new guy, a new patient, which is also belonging to control, hmm, so it's healthy, the resulting parenthetic network is basically random. It has not a big structure. And it's logic, because you are basically taking a, a further element of the same population. So the difference of these elements will be randomly distributed in, the, in all planes of fissions. And therefore, you don't have a clear structure appearing uh, out from your parenclitic representation. Whereas, if you take uh, some patient, you see that the structure is completely different. You see a star-like structure. So, by the way, you have an immediate way of saying, okay, you, are, you have a disease. You are, in this case, you're healthy. In this case, you're not healthy. You have problems. But what is more important is that you have a star. And therefore, you have a center of the star. And the center of the star is telling you which is actually the me metabolite responsible, in your case, for having uh, the best differences from that population. Because the center of a star means that this specific metabolite, uh, in all planes that contains this specific metabolite, has one of the axes, 
you have maximal distance with the population. So it immediately points you also, not only you can use uh, this method as a you know, classifier, but it tells you something more than a classifier. It tells you where you are not cl classifiable in the, in the other stuff. And so now this is nice, it's for a disease, so let's go to something uh, more serious. You take uh, an expression level of a plant, Arabidopsis thaliana, which is a very famous plant, it's considered one of the reference plants, and uh, this is 22,591 genes that constitute the ADN of this plant, the full, and you follow that expression uh, during a growth process in which initially the plant is uh, subjected to some stress, some osmotic stress which is a very important issue because you know that now abiotic stresses in plants are the major cause of crop uh, reduction, not uh, biotic stresses. Biotic stresses are easy now, they kill the, the animals very easy. Okay, so you have, uh, the exp you, you plant these plants and then you measure the entire gene's expression, which is a blood test, gene number one that, you know, at 5 minutes, 10, 60, 120, 240 uh, minutes after the stress. Now, the idea is you use as reference population at each time all the other time expressions. So at each time you have five other members which are the same plant but at a later time, at different time. So you want to know at time, for, for instance, five, which are the, the, the genes uh, which deviate at this time from the relationship that they usually have at all the other times. So your normal population is this. Of course, this is huge because you have how many planes you have here. You have 22,000 square planes. In each one of these planes, you make a linear fit. Uh, allow my, myself with five points is the best you can do. And then you create the, uh, the parenclitic network. This is the parenclitic network at time 30, which is not here. After half an hour, you have this parenclitic network, and you see that again, it is made of many stars. Two minutes, yes. It's made of many stars. Therefore, I can argue that the centers of these stars are indeed the most important genes that are regulating the response of the plant to this, this kind of stress. Because are the ones that in different times of the plant evolution have some deviation, strong deviation. And this is the list of these genes. At different times I can take normal, for example, centrality, I immediately get the center of the stars, I rank the, the, the nodes of my networks by centrality, and I take the first five at, e at each uh, time step. Mm -hmm. So I go to a plant genetist and I say, these genes have a meaning or not? And they say, oh, oh I mean, many of them we know that uh, are involved in, uh, in this kind of stress, but some of them we didn't know. Okay? We don't know. So we took the seven, actually, and we constructed an experiment in which you have, you grow the wild type of the plant and seven transgenic lines in which you kick out exactly the gene that was uh, predicted by the net parenclitic network representation. And you see that the wild type has what we call wild phenotype as a particular growth, and in all other cases, the plant grows eh, in a very, very different way. With, uh, for example, root lens, these are photos of the plants, which are all uh, sigmas out of this. I just want to finish because I want to show you that it, genetically this is a very tiny modification. You are just kicking out one gene out of 22,591. Eh? And this gene is only responsible for changing the phenotype from this to this. Hmm? 
Okay, I have no time. Uh, I, of course, we are now uh, applying this to tons of data, as you can imagine. And, uh, but uh, uh, the main spirit that I want to sh show you is that we have indeed a method to apply uh, network theory also to a huge other class of data that so far were not considered to be possible to have a network representation. Thank you a lot. Uh, we are on time. Uh, actually, there is uh, only 30 seconds, so I prefer to give the time of my questions to questions to the other speakers. And so we pass to the next speaker, who is, uh, who is uh, Feng Fu yes. from ATH Zurich. And he is speaking us a very interesting. Uh, which is the evolution of homophily. Thank you. My name is Feng Fu. I'm, yes, as, I'm from UTH. Previously, I worked with, uh, as a PhD student with Martin Lewak, and a very short while postdoc with Nicholas Christakis. And we did a pro little project a while ago on explaining the widespread wide homophily in the natural world. So, so this, this homophily in physics, we often call it assortativity or whatever, so in biology you call it assort uh, assortment, assortative mating, whatever. Uh, in sociology, we term it like homophily. I hope you wouldn't again, against, uh, use this terminology. <coughs> so homophily describes the social phenomenon that, that birds of a, flock, a feather flock together. So in other words, it describes the tendency for individuals to interact with similar others. So here, as I say here, these three birds with three feathers, like drink together, one, this little poor guy with one feather. So on the opposite, heatherfully means, means like individuals prefer to inter, inter, interact with uh, dissimilar others. So in the natural world, homophily is widespread, like in this afternoon, Professor uh, talks about this, like the microbials from these fruit, uh, fruiting bodies. So in their end of, in this fruiting body uh, stage, it's, it's, they rely on this homophily adhesion protein to form this slug and so on and so on. If we knock out the gene, such that this cell couldn't produce this kind of similar protein. So this cell couldn't stick to this aggregate population. So it's, Falls out, and also it, it also exists in dolphins. Dolphins choose who to interact with during the daily activities. So in fact, they have a very strong gender-based homophily. So it's like male swim with males, female whatever. So interact with females. So and also in this conference, <laughs> we have a very strong gender homophily. Most uh, participants are male. We have very few female. I hope we will have equal presence of female scientists in next meeting, whatever. <laughs> so, I mean, human, for humans, also, this figure shows. Yeah. <laughs> in humans, like, this figure shows uh, like a high school friendship network. So, each different colors spend different races. So, it's also, we can buy something. It's, it's from the Ed Health network. It's a very large data set. Yeah, so, exist strong homophily, like see these white and black intact themselves. And we ask the question how natural selection selects such homophily or how and why similarity breeds connections. So 
we conceptualize, uh, conceptualize this phenomenon in terms of this homophily driver. There exists homophily driver. So there is a finite population and individuals, there are m different phenotypes. You can respond this here respond different shapes of circles, uh, different shapes. And each individual is criticized by uh, homophily preference. It's a continuous variable in, within uh, zero one. It, det it drives how it drives how individuals choose to interact with different types or same types. If, if this individual ha 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 are the same type, they form link with this probability. If they have, if they are of the different type, they form a link with this kind of probability. So the utility of this form, this bond, whatever, so it has to be some benefit. So we think of this situation in terms of very simple a pair of structure. So if these two individuals had the same phenotypes and they form a link, they will receive pair of A. And if they differ, they're different, they will receive pair of B. So we can think of this pair of result from synergy. A, B is a result from specialization because they are, their phenotypes are different. So as a result, this is a very simple setup from a very simple coordination game. And after that, we used to do some meet meeting scheme because how two people came into bump into other. So here we study a very unbiased random matching scheme. So so each individual is just just a random bump to each other. So there's no bias that doesn't depend on their phenotype and so on. And after that, we do some pair of counting uh, like who meets whom. There is uh, like this matrix, and also according to the matrix, we can calculate the expected pair of and this this thing. So each individual has a strategy, P, I, or Q, I. So it, whether it is selected, selected by nature selection, it depends on the, its average pair. Of. So after that, we do some natural selection. So each individual is, this individual is chosen pro, with probability proportional to its fitness. It produces it, uh, as offspring, it replace another individual from the population. So it's gone, and the new, new, new guy replaces this guy, and, new links were generated. And also such reproduction is, is subject to mutation, so this guy could be, uh, could be mutated to, to a different strategy, so, and, and also a different phenotypes. So, so in this way, we construct a very conceptual model to think about this problem. So the benefit of the one with conceptual homology in this way, we can estimate the homophily purpose from a wide variety of social nerve range from humans, uh, animals, and so on. It, <clears throat> and also, eventually, we need to calculate which, select, uh, which strategy eventually most favored, most favored by, by nature selection. So here, we care about this material selection equilibrium in the long run, full of plots. So here, is, it's very complex, the like, technical stuff. Basically, we use like coalescence theory from population genetic to combine with uh, game theory to calculate, and also we have to assume a very important assumption in a limited weak selection. That means it's just a perturbation from neutral evolution. So, and we derive a simple rule for evolution homophily. The population tend to evolve homophily preference. This p we have logic to, and a large k times p is very elegant <coughs> simple rule for homophily. And we can see the, we can also derive the stationary distribution of strategies for, for these different cases. So here, if the k equals k times b is, represents a symmetry breaking point, if, and that uh, these two like uh, heterophily evolves and homophily evolves and this uh, associate network snapshot for that. And also we can say what determines evolution of homophily, we can, plot this configure and say decrease in number of phenotypes and mutation rates and phenotype, phenotypic mutation rates, it all favors the evolution of homophily. And we can also look at the population average, change these parameter, these model parameters. And we can also introduce bias during the matching process. So like the interaction tend to be more likely to happen between individuals who are drawn to or drawn from the same environment. So we have this five parameter, it makes it easier for, uh, for homophily to evolve. And uh, so previously we only talked about one set of 
phenotype of crop. In a reality, you have multiple set of phenotypes that dip, uh, has different functionality. So this is like a multi-layer network, so networks. So here, like we have both homophily in two in both layer networks, and this is issues like uh, on one layer networks is homophily, on the other network is heterophily. It's like for scientific collaboration, most likely specialization prevails, so it's heterophily prevails. But for other hobbies and so on, it's homophily drives the whole social networks. And also, also here, so specifically, we can extend the simple game coordination to a cooperation game. So then, the game is criticized by a homophily cooperation. So, it's it's co-illusion. This how determine who, who this guy how to how they how this guy choose a partner and how the guy cooperate with this partner. So it's it's related to the Greenbeard Greenbeard estrogen in evolution biology. Yeah. So. I think that's should probably my talk. So yeah, that's it. Okay. Perfect timing. There are questions. So if not, we, we take again. I'm yeah. sorry, but we are really in, the, in delay. So uh, uh, I prefer to thank again our, our speaker. And uh, we will move uh, to our next speaker. My pleasure to announce Bernard Cazelle. <laughs> ah, you stop. You are being dressed. Okay, so Bernard Cazelle from Université Pierre et Marie Curie uh, in Paris. And uh, the title of the talk is Uniform Phase and Chaotic Amplitude Dynamics May Explain the unpredictability of influenza A epidemics in temperate areas. So uh, I will speak uh, about uh, seasonal influenza. So I will start to define what is UPCA dynamics. UPCA is uh, this is an example of UPCA. UPCA is for uniform phase and chaotic amplitude. So we have an example in ecological network. We have uh, populations, and we can be observed that we have uh, some uh, very regular dynamics, but the amplitude of uh, the peaks are completely chaotic. So we have uh, chaotic attractors. And we have a positive Yabonov exponent, but we have, if you make some um, Fourier, uh, per, uh, per, uh, some periodogram, some Fourier uh, spectrum, we have uh, just one peak in the, in the Fourier spectrum. And this kind of dynamics is very uh, common in nature when we have some seasonal forcing. Seasonal forcing due to climate or due to other uh, kind of behavior. So this is the case for uh, seasonal influenza, and we have some examples of uh, evol time evolutions of the epidemics with uh, different uh, strain. We have uh, H1N1, H3, N2, and so on, in different parts in here, in Netherlands, and I think this case is in uh, around Paris. So the main explanation for this uh, kind of more or less din uh, regular dynamics is that the, the, the virus evolves, and we have some punctuate evolutions of, of the virus. And when we have a large modifications of the virus, we have a large epidemics. This is currently the main paradigm, but it's not completely satisfactory. In many cases, it's not the case. So we have also another kind of example in, in, in the state where uh, excess mortality due to pneumonia or, or I don't remember what, it's a proxy of uh, influenza. So one possible explanation is uh, uh, non linear dynamics and UPCA dynamics that can ex explain or partially explain the, the observed dynamics. So we use some classical model. So in epidemiology, the classical model is named SIR. It's based on the human status of the populations. 
we have some sort of breaks. Uh, individuals are susceptible, infected, infectious. In some cases, we can uh, they can remove, they can uh, become immune. In some cases, it can be infected, but not infectious, and so on. So we have some break that depend on the status of the immunity of the of the peoples, and can construct model adapted to the to the disease that, that you see. So the idea is to construct the simple model as possible, and we consider just the, the three main uh, hypotheses to describe uh, the flu epidemics. The first one is to introduce uh, some reintroduction from perhaps the, south, south, the, the tropics, south, south East Asia, for example. We introduce seasonal forcings, and we just consider that a virus will evolve, but will, it will evolve, but gradually. So just three main uh, hypotheses. So we translate these three hypotheses in the classical SIR models. So we consider the seasonal forcing, the influence of infected people from the tropics, and we consider that as the virus evolves, people lose their immunity with these terms. So people become against uh, susceptible. So with this kind of models, you have a rich dynamics, and we can observe this kind of UPCL dynamics with one epidemic exchange, but the peaks of the epidemics is completely chaotic. You can check if this kind of behavior is not pathologic, so we make some sort of, we make some bifurcations uh, on these different uh, value of the parameters. And we can show you here in this bifurcation scheme that uh, the, the first lepton of exponent, when we have hot color, the, the first lepton of exponent is uh, positive, so we have chaotic dynamics. And all the values that are inside uh, the black line it's a value, it's a dynamic for which we have a, a periodicity of one year, around one year, between 10 months and 14 months. So we can see that there is a large part of the, of the parameter space that can generate UPCL dynamics. You can also complexify the model, and we, we use two strain models, for example, H3N2 and H1N1. Uh, and you can see that when you incorporate the second strain, we can increase the region when we observe the UPC dynamics. So this, this is the model for two strands. We have changed the, uh, the kind of model we used. In the previous uh, model, we used a model named statue-based models. All people, we follow the statue of all people. They are susceptible, uh, infectious, and then uh, immune. And in this case, we have changed the kind of uh, frameworks, and we use the statue-based people. So we have uh, R0 is people who are immune, immune to nothing, R1 is people immune to just strain 1, R2 people immune to strain 2, and R12 is people that are immune to strain 1 and strain 2. So we have this kind of um, before questions with other other parameter, we can just observe that when we introduce a second strain, we increase the, the probability to find UPC dynamics. So then you can compare the, the result of the model to observe observations. So in Israel, around Paris, and we can also see that uh, the attractor, and we can see that there is some correspondence between them the attractor observed in, uh, in data and the uh, attractor generated by the, the models. Then after we have uh, tested the robustness of, of the models, we have increased the realism of the model by introducing demography, uh, introducing error distributions. So in the SIR models, the class, uh, when we are in compartment, uh, the distribution is exponential distribution, so using error of distribution, we can use error of distribution thus uh, simply by putting susceptible, inf infected one, infected two, infected three, and then remove. 
we will use the stochastic version of the models, and we use also um, uh, we are meta populations with immigration between uh, different cities and heterous contact uh, due to uh, the ash structure of the populations. So we use this kind of uh, meta populations. We have data um, about uh, fly passenger, in this case between uh, 53 uh, airports. The complete uh, data set from more than uh, 20, uh, 25, uh, no, 250 uh, airports uh, have a cost around two, uh, 200,000 uh, dollars. So, it's, it's expensive. so we just concentrate on uh, 55 uh, airports and uh, we obtain this kind of uh, dynamics with a lot of complexity in, in, in the models. So we have the dynamic, UPC dynamic for the north, the north hemisphere in New York, Washington, and similar dynamics in, um, in the source hemisphere in Buenos Aires and Sydney. Um, I don't see you the, the dynamics in the tropics, but the dynamic in the tropics is not UPC. So I can conclude that non-irregular dynamics alone can induce irregularity, irregular, irregularity sorry, in, uh, of the epidemic amplitude. You don't need to have a punctuate evolution of the virus. This non-irregular intrinsic view with gradual evolutions of the virus constitute a minimal explanation for our irregularity. I don't have the possibility to say this word. Of the recurrent seasonal flu epidemics and their superior dynamics are robust to different perturbations. So I will stop here, but um, I can show you some data from another disease, dengue in Southeast Asia, for example, in Thailand. You have the, the data for the global uh, Thailand, for Bangkok, and for Chiang Mai, the north of Thailand, you can see that the dynamics is, appear very uh, UPC. I can stop here. Oh, yes, I have some of those slides. Finished. You have another two minutes. Two minutes. So oh, we have a, oh. a two-strand model for dengue. We have four strand. Uh, four strand. Uh, we have four four different virus, four strands, and we have this kind of dynamics. So you can see that in this part we obtain uh, UPC dynamics, and um, we have this kind of result in. in um, in red is the observations. In gray, this is uh, the, uh, the simula one, uh, 1,000 simulations. In the, the black line, the dash black line, is uh, one realization of the stochastic models. So UPCI can explain also this kind of dynamics. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Please, question here. Do you think it's possible to disentangle the variability due to the UPCA dynamics from the variability that you could have from a genetic drift? Uh, I think it's, it's possible. If we have data, it's possible. But it's, this is just a minimal explanation. It's clear for that in the reality, is not perfect. But people working on this kind of model think that uh, non linearity is not the main explanation. So. But just yeah, using just uh, uh, punctuate uh, evolution is not uh, able to explain all the all the observations. There is another question over there. Yeah. How do you how do you incorporate the age structure into the immigration? Yeah, sorry, I don't hear. How do you incorporate the age structure into the immigration of the population? So for the migrations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. just so the incorporate the. We have uh, information for about the flying, about um, the number of passengers between different airports. We know how many uh, people go from Mexico to New York uh, in average uh, a, a given month. There is a further question from uh, Maurice. So uh, the, the model FIR is well known, okay? Yeah. So how do you see the signature of this uh, character? <coughs> uniform, phase, uniform phase and chaotic amplitude in, in the equation. What did you oh, modify yeah. in the equation to get this 
we have, ju ju we have just explored uh, the behavior of the models just by computing the Lyapunov exponent and uh, no, the Fourier spectrum. The, the, where you have uh, the chaos only in the amplitude, but not in the phase. The, we have a, the peak is not a direct function, so in the Fourier spectrum, so okay. it's more or less uh, constant. But uh, for but example, for for how for flu, for flu, it's between uh, ten months and forty months. It's not twelve months. Yeah, but oh, okay. this question, the answer is a very generic model. Even yeah. neurons have exactly the same representation. So I would ask you the same question. In the parameter space of the SRI with the neurons, I never saw such a regime. So if I want to fish from that regime, what I should do? That's his question. Yes. Yeah, you have to explore the parameter space. Ah, you have to explore yeah. everywhere. Yeah. yeah. But uh, is but it not tiny or not is everywhere. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You need yeah. to have some uh, okay. biological We need some wine and discuss it. Nah. <laughs> oh, we need, the, we need the, to pass to our new speaker. And, and, and I'm very honored to, 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 to present Professor Ravindra Amritkar uh, from the Institute of Infrastructure, Technology, Research and Management in Maninaga, is it? Maninaga in India. And the title of the talk is very important, Extreme Events on Networks. Please. So let me thank the organizers for this opportunity to speak to you and this conference. Uh, I'm going to talk about some work which we have been doing. I will, this is from where I come. This is, that is the Ahmedabad. This is the western region of India. And that is the place. Uh, this is, as I said, that these are the uh, things. Uh, these are the collaborators <laughs> with whom we have been doing. Uh, and the whole topic, this was what we tried to do was that it's the plan that there are extreme events, extreme events people have studied, but uh, when you take a network, there is al always a relation between extreme event on a node and extreme event for the entire network. So our objective was to see the correlation between the two, <coughs> rather than just studying the extreme event for the entire, for a single node and for the entire network and how they actually correlate uh, among themselves. That was actually the thing. So what I'll do is that I'll uh, there are extreme events, then networks, and uh, then extreme events on networks, that is for individual nodes, and then how that can lead to a network failure, that is actually for the conclusion. So this was actually the objective of the study. Extreme events are, of course, known, and I think uh, uh, we have already talked about in a previous talk, Lukarini, he uh, mentioned already the extreme events. That is, they are something which is there. So, in fact, there have been various definitions of extreme events, but which the ones which uh, I am going to use is the simple definition that is uh, given a probability distribution for the occurrence of an event of given magnitude, an extreme event is an event whose magnitude is greater than a threshold. That's the event, uh, that's the definition which I will be using. That is the uh, thing. So this is slightly different from what was used earlier. So there are two methods of analyzing extreme events. Uh, this was the method which was already talked about. That is, you take the uh, time series and then divide, divide it into equal intervals of time and find out the maximum in each interval and study the statistics of that. There's another method is that you put a threshold and see what are the values above that particular threshold. And these two uh, methods are uh, similar, but if you consider independent, identically distributed variables, then uh, the first method leads to what was already talked about, the generalized uh, extreme event distribution, which leads to three Gumbel, Frechel, and Bainbul as the three uh, uh, classes. But the, if you consider a threshold and extreme events of that threshold, then you get what is called as a Pareto distribution, not uh, one of these uh, other three distributions. So the distribution is somewhat different. It's the second uh, uh, way of characterization which I'm going to use in my talk, not the <coughs> first uh, way of doing it. So these two are somewhat different uh, ways of 
characterizing the different things. Uh, let me uh, say extreme events are quite well known. This is a few examples of extreme events. What uh, I've chosen is to point out that there are extreme events which take place on underlying network. So this was Barack Obama fan page. There is an extreme event in when actually I think the the Osama Laden thing, there was an extreme event at that particular thing. And uh, this is, so there is an underlying network of fans of Obama. So it's network and uh, that actually gives rise to an extreme event. This is the uh, thing. So there is an, again, extreme event slowing down of a network. So there is a uh, WW, this internet network, how it slows down at some particular time. But there are two examples which are same examples, actually the blackout examples, where there is an underlying power grid network. And the power grid network actually leads to a failure. This was the very recent, that is the last year, uh, 2012. Uh, there is a half of Indian, uh, complete the country, went into complete blackout for almost uh, one day, full day. And uh, there was a half of the grid, there are three grids, and uh, all the three grids failed. In the complete country, half of the thing was a complete blackout. And this is the old example of USA blackout in 2003, uh, where there was a quite an, some similar blackouts have taken place uh, in many other countries also. I think uh, Germany also had one, and several other countries also have had. So there is an underlying network, and that network is leading to some behavior which is of the entire network. Uh, and so this was the thing. So this is, uh, let me not get into. So our objectives was very general, but there are many questions which one can answer. I have not answered all of them, but let us see what are the, first is to develop a model for extreme events on networks. So what is the definition of an extreme event as well as, for the node as well as for the entire network, how do you analyze this? And then the, what are the properties of such extreme events? Can you predict them, etc., and how that particular thing can lead to a network failure? <coughs> Extreme events can lead to a network failure. So this was actually what uh, the objectives of our study. I don't think we have answered all the questions, but made some attempt towards uh, that particular thing. So we started with a very simple model. We thought that let us start with the simplest model that one could think of, that is random walks on a network. Uh, statistically, this is more relevant for a traffic problem uh, rather than, but uh, the conclusions appear to be more general, probably applicable to other uh, networks also. So if I consider a random walk on a network with n edges, uh, n nodes and e edges and w non-interacting walkers, uh, so that's a basic network, basic uh, network and then I see how, I, let's put a random walk, that is every time step, I at a, a walker takes a step to a neighboring node with some probability. You can take either a biased or unbiased walk, it doesn't matter. Uh, I will rest it only with an unbiased walk, but I, we have also studied the biased walk. So this is the simple model which we take. And uh, for such a model, it is well known that uh, if I take an unbiased walk, uh, then there is a stationary probability distribution asymptotically, which is uh, that the uh, a walker will be on a node uh, probability will be simply proportional to the degree of the node. This is a well-known result that the walker will, will be on a node with a probability proportional to its degree. So once I have the probability, suppose I put uh, large number of walkers, uh, uh, W walkers. So capital W is the total number of walkers uh, and if I put them on the network, then what is the probability that small W of them are on a particular node? And that will be, if they are not interacting, it will be simply a binomial distribution. Uh, if uh, I take uh, non-interacting walkers. And then I can find out the mean, which is which we call as a flux for a binomial distribution and its standard deviation. Uh, both are, of course, uh, well-known results. And so the question was how to fix uh, what is a threshold. And this is an example from Indian thing that is, what is an extreme event for a node now? This was the question. And we say that the extreme event threshold depends on the node. So these are two, two uh, squares uh, where the traffic problem, uh, it was in our capital city, Delhi. Uh, there are several cars going through and you can see that uh, you can uh, extreme event there. 
even if 100 cars are there, it still not, may not be an extreme event. But this is from a very famous Indian uh, novel, which is called Malgudi Days. There's a village square where never a car never comes. So even one car comes, it's an extreme event. <laughs> so an extreme event depends on the node. This was our basic observation that it, it is, you must define an extreme event specific to a node and not a general definition. And so what means, so I must choose the flux that is the mean number for that node and a standard deviation times some number. That is the threshold that we choose, which could vary from node to node. So it's not a uh, thing which, is, which should depend on generally for all nodes, but node to node variation of the extreme event is required. That's what our conclusion was. And so once we have that definition that there is a threshold which depends on the node, we uh, then can simply sum up uh, above that threshold and find out what is the probability of the extreme event. So that was a binomial distribution. I simply sum it up and what I get is an incomplete beta function as the probability of having an extreme event on a node. And I get a, uh, if I know the probability, I can find out and it comes out to be a bi binomial distribution, the incomplete beta function. And here is the simulation result. That's the incomplete beta function. Uh, dashed line is the incomplete beta function. And the dotted line is the numerical simulation for a node of, uh, I think this was for a, the, for a, uh, this, uh, this was as for a scale-free network. And uh, the average was over 100 realizations with a node of 5,000 uh, nodes. So it's a fairly big uh, thing. And the conclusion which was interesting that uh, we, when we plotted the uh, thing versus the degree, the probability of the extreme event versus the degree, what we found was that this most important conclusion is that the small degree nodes have a higher probability of extreme events than <coughs> the uh, node with a larger degree. And this was sort of initially it appeared to be a non-intuitive observation. Uh, means why, why should small degree node have a larger probability for extreme event? But when one thinks about it, what it happens is that the large degree nodes have a large flux, but, uh, but the fluctuations are small. Small degree nodes have a small flux, but the fluctuations are large. That's the reason why uh, the uh, probability of extreme events is larger for small degree nodes than for the larger degree nodes. That's, a, that's what the, our uh, basic observation was. And so we actually considered some deviations also. Let me come to the network failure. So suppose I have this particular, so the model is that same model, but now whenever there is an extreme event on a node, what I will say that I, that node has failed. I will just say that that node has failed. So if I, that node has failed, what I do is that I have this total number of walkers on that particular node. If some node fails, that it has an extreme event, that node is failed. And so the walkers on that node, the rest of the nodes must share the load. So the walkers on the node actually are moved to the other nodes. And then that node and the connections are removed. So that's the model, so which we continue to particular do this particular way. And uh, if you, the simple node model needs to, this. let me consider a completely connected network. And uh, there are various curves, the, all the curves for different realizations. I have plotted five different realizations of my model. And uh, the, uh, initially, the, there are sim, 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 simple failures and suddenly at some time, uh, there is a sudden cascade of failure start and then afterwards the entire network fails. This is what we found. And so the, uh, this was an interesting thing. Then we, what we did was that we did some analysis which is time independent about the number of failures, capacity per load and the number of failures and then we could analyze different zones that is independent failures, cascade of failures and overload failures. We could divide that. Uh, this, so this was the different definition. Uh, now, what was, what was the special thing about this? See, this has been the network failures have been analyzed by many other people. It's not that we were the first to analyze this particular thing. But what we have pointed out that it is not necessary to have any, all other models which we had earlier had some external input to that. Okay, some, some external input was always put in. What we point out that it is not necessary to have any external input 
just the internal fluctuations of the dynamics are sufficient to cause the entire network failure. You don't need any external input. Just an internal fluctuation of the dynamics, you can ca cause the entire network to fail. Okay. This was the important uh, finding that we had, that we don't need any external fluctuations. <laughs> then we did other uh, analysis, like we, this is for scale-free network, random networks. Then we did what is the effect on the degree distribution, uh, what effect on the structure of the network is of this network failure. There is some like return map also. Uh, so let me conclude. So we, the model of extreme events for individual nodes, and then we said that the smaller degree nodes are important. They are they have a larger probability of failure, and then we point out the importance of internal fluctuations of the dynamics. We show that they alone are sufficient to cause a network failure. You can have also external effects which can accelerate that, but it's not required. So the conclusion is that when I have a power grid network failure. I don't need any external input. The power grid network can fail on its own due just because of the internal fluctuations of the loads. It's not necessary to have any. That's why even for a very advanced country where technology is the highest, even USA can have a power grid failure. Every country can have that. Because it's only by the internal fluctuations. So this is our conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot. Uh, we have time only for one short question. Yeah. Very short because uh, it's uh, we have very pressed on time. Almost, I almost finished. The question is, uh, there is no interaction between the walkers. Yeah. So, but in traffic, for instance, interaction is very important. So, can we consider your model a linear approximation to that situation? Yeah. The walker yeah. never, never interact. Huh. Yeah, we, we tried that, but so far we have not got any results so far. But I don't think for small interactions it should not change. The interactions are too large, I don't know what will happen. Another one? Right. Did I understand correctly, is there a relation between the high probability of extreme event and the failure of the network? Yeah, okay. See, the high probability we said was for smaller degree nodes. Smaller yes, degree nodes. Yes. Okay, so when we find out the network failure, initial failures are all for small degree nodes. Okay, and uh, then uh, so at some stage, even the other degree, uh, the higher degree nodes yes, also okay. come into the picture. Okay, this is what happens. Okay, so let us thank a lot to our speaker, and all the other speaker of the session. So we are drawing. Uh, Till the end. Now it's the most important part of the conference starts. <laughs> no. Oh, no. Dinner must be gained. And it's a pleasure for me to give the words to Dr. Eleonora Presani, who is the publisher for high energy physics of Elsevier, to conclude, you know, and, and, and speak uh, about what is the impression of Elsevier about this conference and in general about Germany. Yeah, so thank you very much everybody and especially thanks for the people who came from uh, very far away because I mean it's really appreciated that uh, you all uh, joined this event and we are really happy. Uh, especially because uh, I think, uh, uh, well we put a lot of effort uh, together with the editors uh, to make uh, the Journal of Causalities and Fractals uh, uh, a good journal and I think uh, we are uh, doing a really good job I'm pre pretty proud of it <laughs> I think that uh, so in 2010 uh, uh, the editorial board completely changed uh, Paolo and Maurice joined the board of the journal and uh, they started to do really a great uh, a great job to the journal so the first thing I think that uh, the rejection rate uh, was uh, yeah in went uh, crazy I think at the beginning was about 98 percent something like that and now it's still above uh, 80 percent so the the papers that are published uh, I think are uh, generally of a very good quality we received about uh, uh, 1100 uh, papers per year and about 150 are published so it's really uh, a tough work for the editors so Stefano has recently joined and I think uh, he's uh, giving a great uh, uh, energy and contribution to the journal. Uh, I think it's also nice uh, uh, to, mm, that the editorial uh, uh, time has improved a lot in the last uh, few years. So it takes about uh, eight weeks uh, to 
um, for the author to receive uh, the first decision on their paper. So it's a. Uh, I think it's, it's a good uh, result and uh, might improve in the, in the future, but I think it's already quite, uh, quite good. And uh, in general, I think uh, the journal has really a new face. It has, uh, uh, the editors have worked, of course, a lot, but uh, also the, the content of the journal is very different. And I think this is what we wanted to, um, to show with this, with this conference, really. So to give uh, an idea of the interdisciplinarity and uh, of all the different aspects uh, that we want to have in the journal. So I would like to thank you again for yeah, the, your contributions and I hope that uh, it was a good occasion for also all of you to, to share ideas and to, to brainstorm a, li a little bit. Hopefully it will be, maybe there will be more occasions to, to do something like this. I hope that if you liked it, uh, we can do it again. And I uh, will leave uh, the word to Stefano, that uh, is menaceous <laughs> today. <laughs> no, I, I really uh, think that we all have to thank gratefully and severe for this occasion. It's really unusual that, uh, you know, uh, an editorial decides to directly organize a conference and to directly pay the tree for all the people to come here. So I think they really need our thank. Uh, uh, and I want to thank, of course, Eleonora. And I also want to thank all the other ladies that stayed all the days with us. I hope uh, we didn't know you. <laughs> I want to, to, to thank, uh, we have uh, Sharon Duemeyer, uh, which is the publishing director of physics of Elsevier. Then Eleonora, of course, uh, that everybody knows. Jelena Petrovic, it's uh, our angel because she is reading all the 1,100 uh, submissions and she's the managing editor of our, uh, no, she's really uh, one uh, fundamental element of the philosophical chapter. Imagine that she reads 1,100 papers a year. So when uh, I have my students, you have to teach them how to do because they don't read the literature anymore. But, so you, you read all of them and, and she makes a fantastic filter with a lot of details, helping it tremendously. I mean, all of us in taking decision in deciding what to do about papers. So it's really uh, precious for us. And Mareike Gutschner, uh, yeah, it's well pronounced, is the, uh, is the man, uh, sorry, he <laughs> is the marketing manager, marketing manager of, of the journal. So thank to you and thank to uh, to, to the journal. We now have add, we have to add also Sumanta. S yeah, Sumanta for sure. Sumanta is not, is not. She is not here. He, she is uh, helping us a lot. Uh, uh, with all technical details about submissions, reports. So, I mean, we have really been supported by a tremendous staff. So, we are now in condition to improve, we hope, our job. Now, these are the diplomatic part, okay? Now, the non-diplomatic part is that we have to be concrete in showing our gratefulness to, to Elsevier. And being concrete means help us, the editorial staff, to improve more and more the quality of the journal. So we need that from this occasion, everybody takes a sort of, you know, commitment eh, to be on the side of the journal, to promote the journal, to be active in their own network of scientific, uh, you know, connections, which will uh, has many connections, he goes and the, so next uh, conference you go, you have, I've been in a tremendous conference <laughs> in Amsterdam, <laughs> organized by Chaos Circles of Fracta. What's a fantastic journal. You have to, so this is the way you have to be. Hmm? But this is only point one. Then you have to be active in supporting the journal, considering this a good venue for your paper. So we expect that from the people that are here, as Paolo said, we receive more and more contribution from their group and the group of their collaborators. If you have a very a good paper and you're looking a way of disseminating it, uh, you have to take it to account as well. Let's put to chaos. So, attention, as is written here, be the research, get published. No, 
So we need, uh, we need the very good contribution. And especially, I want to point out something, in my opinion, very important, which are the tutorial papers. Uh, we have, of course, we publish a lot uh, of original papers, but also we would like to have very good, you know, tutorial paper that uh, focus uh, on a given uh, uh, thing and give a sort of overview of, of these things. So, please, the, all the person that came here, take the, you know, so to say, the commitment in the next uh, year, in the next 12 months, to send us one uh, paper of research and to at least <laughs> Uh, at least uh, 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 force another group uh, to do the same. Okay, so we have already 40 papers if this comes of very high quality. And, and we saw that the, the quality of this conference was very, very high. If you don't do this, you know that I'm going to Israel. Eh? I, I said that I will pass this book to the Mossad, <laughs> and after 12 months, I will, I will mark the names of the ones who didn't submit. Okay, so be careful. Eh? Then, in, <clears throat> sorry, no, but this is serious. I mean, uh, we, uh, I, I have to tell that Paolo and, 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 and Maurice have the major, major role in uh, really producing this. I just came uh, at, at the end and I have zero uh, uh, role in this. So Paolo and, 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 and Maurice has to Maurice really... For you much more than me. Yeah, you know, I mean, anyway, you have the real, uh, the real... Uh, but, but even though we are three now, even though we are three now, uh, for the maximum we can do, we cannot do this without serious help of a group of friends which are our associate editors, but also with a group of people that really look at the journal in a different way. We need this and we need to spread the journal as much as possible in our environment. So please help us, otherwise Mossad. <laughs> so uh, the other uh, thing I want to say is that I was advised that now there is a big conflict. There should be one hour 15 of discussion, but we have to leave the building at 8. There's no way we have to go to the restaurant and they, because they are very generous, <laughs> prepared even a pre-dinner, uh, that is, they prepared some little food, beer, yes. wine. So, how can I make the discussion in front of such an argument? <laughs> Especially because otherwise I have this guy that will, uh, will, will go to the Mossad. He will go to the Mossad. So, the only point I really would like to say is the following. Tomorrow, we continue working because we have, in the morning, a meeting of the three editor-in-chief with the staff of Elsevier, and then after, during lunch and after lunch, also the, uh, all the uh, other uh, associate editor of the journal will meet with us. Uh, and so we will discuss many things. But I would like that using the time uh, between one glass of wine and the other, as well as using the time that we have in the dinner, so because we cannot now stay two hours, uh, you give us, eh, everybody of you, and especially those associate editors that cannot stay tomorrow at, at the meeting, as uh, Maurice suggested me to say, ideas on a clear plan of focus issues for the next two years. So I think that the best, together with having ensured that you will submit the paper, <laughs> the end of paper uh, otherwise. Eh? The other point is that we have to exit from here with a clear calendar of focus issues that are touching the six, seven, eight, nine, ten hot point that we think and we want the journal to be, you know, a reference. I have few titles that, and few proposals that I try to collect from one talk, another from personal contact. Uh, one is on multi-layer networks, another one is the concept of understanding, another one bridging complex networks and data, data mining. Extreme event, I think, is a very important uh, uh, issue that we should uh, do something. Extreme event on networks also, <coughs> in general, 
uh, role of fractional calculus you as propose as, a, as far as emergent properties and criticality is concerned. But we are, we, we are only four or five of such. I think we have to exit tomorrow with them with at least 12 titles. And uh, if you agree, I think uh, we, we shortly spoke with the other editor-in-chief. We think the best is this. This should come really as a proposal from your side. And we would like to have guest editors which are also outside the uh, editorial uh, associate editorial uh, staff. We would like uh, really to assign the guest editorship to people that want to contribute to the journal. We offer, of course, for each one of these, one person that can be one of our, our three or another, but just to help, not to participate as guest editor. If in case you have any problem of, you know, timing uh, or of, uh, you know, you have a reference in us. Uh, and so we just, uh, so to say, person that are there, uh, we follow you, we'll ask you, how is this? Uh, but not, uh, I mean, it, it must be really something done by you. So I would like to exit tomorrow with a list of 12 topics, possible 12 guest editors or pairs of guest editors. And for each one of these, the person of the editorial board who follow who will follow this. Okay, so of course, uh, some guest, uh, some topic issue can be also edited by us, but really, I would like not to be only us. I really would like that this would be also the way of uh, you know, improving our, our community. So, I have this proposal. Please, from now to midnight, yeah. like, more or less, <laughs> come to me because I have to fill down this. Okay, so to, and I have before, to. Eh? Before sleeping, you want to. Before drinking, after drinking. Before drinking. Or after, before uh, I, I, I'm a strong guy. You, you will see, I'm a strong guy. You know? I, I will resist. The first gallon usually I resist. The second gallon starts to be a problem. So, given this, I really would like also to thank all of you for having. Uh, arrived here for having contributed to this con conference and where we go? We go just uh, uh, at the end of the corridor on the other side of the elevators and then there is a coffee uh, bar or something where there is the refreshments for us. Okay, clap to continue.